Let's talk about laboratory testing for COVID-19 again. What's new since we talked about this in August? A lot. Here are some of the questions we'll talk about. Do positive antibody tests indicate that people are immune to infection by SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19? What sample types might replace the dreaded nasopharyngeal swab for more comfortable sample collection? And finally, what are the new rapid tests for COVID-19 and how should they be used? Welcome to Editors in Conversation. This episode is brought to you by the Journal of Clinical Microbiology, available at jcm.asm.org and on Twitter at jclinmicro. I'm your host, JCM Editor-in-Chief, Alex McAdam. This podcast is supported by the American Society for Microbiology, which publishes JCM. I'm joined by two expert guests to discuss diagnostic testing for SARS-CoV-2. First, Dr. Melissa Miller, who is director of both the Clinical Molecular Microbiology Laboratory and the Clinical Microbiology Laboratory at the University of North Carolina School of Medicine. Dr. Miller is also an editor of JCM. Welcome, Melissa. I'm glad you could join us. Thanks for having me back. We're also joined by Dr. Elitza Thiel, who is the director of the Infectious Diseases Serology Laboratory at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Dr. Thiel is a member of the editorial board of JCM. Welcome, Ellie. Thank you for being here. Glad to be back. Ellie, I'd like to start with a question about immunity to COVID-19. We've accepted an article in JCM titled, Neutralizing Antibodies Correlate with Protection from SARS-CoV-2 in Humans During a Fishery Vessel Outbreak with a High Attack Rate, which Dr. Alexander Greninger is the corresponding author for. The New York Times said that this article provides, quote, the first direct evidence in humans that antibodies to the coronavirus can thwart infection. Before we get into the study, can you quickly explain what neutralizing antibodies are? Yeah, sure. So um, antibodies, I think, can generally be kind of split up into two bins, if you will. So there's binding antibodies, which I think of more like flagging antibodies that recruit other components of the immune system to the invading pathogen and then kind of collectively destroy it. And then there's neutralizing antibodies, which largely function in a more independent manner, primarily by binding to specific epitopes on the virus that inhibit viral attachment and entry into host cells and so ultimately limit or inhibit viral replication. And so these neutralizing antibodies have really um, been, or I guess I should say they are kind of key markers of protective immunity against viral pathogens. And they're really what therapy with convalescent plasma from COVID-19 recovered patients has, um, have been based on. Thank you. So neutralizing antibodies, clearly what we want. Um, with that as background, can you explain how the authors investigated whether the presence of anti-COVID-19 antibodies provides protection against COVID-19 infection? Yeah, so this was a really um, intriguing retrospective study which documented both PCR and serologic uh, results for about 120 fishing boat crew members both before departure and then after they returned to land because of a COVID-19 outbreak that occurred on the boat. So very briefly, prior to departure, 120 out of the 122 tested crew members were PCR negative, and then six of them were antibody positive by the Abbott IgG assay. Interestingly, three of those six antibody positive individuals were also positive by two different tests for neutralizing antibodies specifically. So that was the pre-testing, pre-departure testing. And then um, unfortunately, the authors didn't go into exactly why this occurred, but despite all that testing, there was either a false positive PCR or one of the two crew members that weren't tested were maybe actually infected, uh, but there was ultimately an outbreak on that boat at sea and they had to return to land about 18 days later, at which point all of the crew members were then tested by PCR and serology. And what they found on retesting was that 101 of the 122 crew members were PCR positive on return. And then an additional three members ultimately seroconverted, which resulted in an overall attack or infection rate of 85%, which I think really speaks to the transmissibility of this virus. Um, what was most notable though, is that the three individuals with neutralizing antibodies prior to departure never developed symptoms, and then two of the three were repeatedly PCR negative, uh, while the third individual kind of fluctuated between a negative and a weak positive result um, over about a month period. And the authors ultimately concluded that this may most likely have been residual shedding from his primary infection, although that couldn't conclusively be stated. 
Um, overall, though, considering that high attack rate, the authors found that the lack of infection in the three crew members with neutralizing antibodies was statistically significant compared to the crew members without neutralizing antibodies. And this is really one of the first studies outside of animal models to show or suggest that the presence of neutralizing antibodies is in fact protective against reinfection for at least some period of time. Thank you. And you mentioned an Abbott assay and you, and you also mentioned a neutralizing antibody assay and some differences between those. Can you break that down a little bit more for us? What was the distinction? What, did we, what can we learn about the Abbott assay? Um, sure. So the, the Abbott assay, like the vast majority of other EUA tests out there, um, is a qualitative assay and it does not distinguish between neutralizing uh, antibodies versus binding antibodies. But because of the functionality of neutralizing antibodies and their association with protective immunity, there's been quite a bit of interest in determining whether the signal to cutoff ratios or index values from high throughput binding assays in any way correlate to neutralizing antibody levels. Um, and neutralizing antibodies are much more challenging to determine because classically this would require like plaque reduction neutralization testing or, or pseudovirus neutralization assays, which are still hard to, to do. So what the authors really showed here was that higher Abbott IgG uh, index values were generally associated with the presence of neutralizing antibodies as detected both by a pseudovirus neutralization assay and then a blockade of binding um, ELISA. And I'd say that that sort of trending is really consistent with what we and others have seen, um, but there are still samples that can have high index values by these high throughput assays that are ultimately neutralizing antibody negative. Um, so I think we still have to be careful with how we use or interpret those signal intensities. Um, plus, technically speaking, those values should not actually be reported, given that these assays are only FDA authorized as qualitative tests uh, and reporting per the manufacturer at this point is at least either positive or, or negative or um, indeterminate. So, you know, kind of thinking more broadly about what all this means, when it comes to deciphering what the signal means um, for these qualitative antibody tests, I think um, we really just need to wait and use quantitative antibody assays to make those sorts of statements. And um, those are coming out uh, fairly soon. The caveat is that there's not yet, at least to my knowledge, a universal refer reference material uh, against which they'll all be standardized. Um, so that remains a need in the field. Um, and then if we want to say anything about the level of neutralizing as antibodies in patient samples, I think while it's true that higher signals in these high throughput assays do frequently correlate with higher neutralizing antibody titers, there's still that variability. Um, and I think we'll still need to do some sort of neutralizing at antibody specific tests to provide accurate results if we truly need a neutralizing antibody titer. So it seems like there's more to come on this, but is it fair to say that the high throughput assays are reasonably accurate at detecting whether somebody has had SARS-CoV-2, but perhaps a little bit less accurate about indicating whether or not they have neutralizing antibody? Yeah, I think that's an accurate statement, especially if we're using um, an assay that's been well vetted when it comes to the um, specificity of that particular test, um, or if you're using kind of a, a two-tiered algorithmic approach and you get a positive by both assays, I think we can be fairly confident to say that, yes, you've been infected at some point in the past, um, but we, we can't really say much about the neutralizing antibody level. Thank you. So this wasn't addressed in the JCM paper that we're talking about, but can you tell us how long people have antibodies after they have been infected? Yeah, um, I don't think there's really a singular easy answer to that question um, because it looks like the longevity and the durability of that humoral immune response seems like it's really dependent on multiple different factors, like whether or not the patient was asymptomatic versus if they had mild disease or severe disease. 
And then to an extent, it also depends on what type of assay was used to do the testing. Um, so did it detect IgM or IgG or total antibodies? And then what was the viral antigen that was that the assay was, was based on? All of these, I think we're seeing have an impact on how long we can detect antibodies. Um, generally speaking though, if we focus just on IgG, I'd say that the majority of studies seem to show that there is a general decline in antibody levels against epitopes of the spike protein over about a two to three month period after um, initial symptom onset in symptomatic patients, obviously. Um, and I'd say that we've seen something similar here in serial samples that we've collected from convalescent plasma donors that we've tested through multiple high throughput binding assays and, and neutralizing antibody tests. Um, we similarly see a rapid kind of a decline in relative antibody levels over about a three month period, although all individuals still remain qualitatively positive. And this sort of antibody trending, you know, is really consistent with what we see for the other common coronaviruses. So I'd say it's not entirely unexpected. Interestingly, though, um, a few studies, including a recently published one in the New England Journal of Medicine um, from Iceland, showed that IgG antibodies against the nucleocapsid protein are stable for at least four months uh, post-infection. And that seems to be in direct contradiction to earlier studies kind of complicating things. Um, so I do think that some of these differences that we're seeing um, are impacted by the assay that, that's, that's used. But what's important to remember is that antibody levels do typically decline after a primary infection because those um, effector B cells that are in, induced by an acute infection, um, they're frequently short-lived. Uh, but serologic memory is very likely maintained for longer periods of time by your memory B cells, which would reactivate on reinfection. So the questions I think that remain um, are many um, and uh, in include things like how long do those memory B cells last and what's the minimum threshold, if you will, of antibodies that are needed to provide that level of immunity, which likely won't be sterilizing immunity, but will hopefully lessen the severity of disease. Um, so lots of questions, I think, still out there on this topic. And you, you mentioned the spike protein. What's the significance of the spike protein in this context? So the spike protein um, contains the receptor binding domain, which is what binds to the ACE2 receptor on host cells. Um, and so the, the idea here is that if we have antibodies to, this, to, the, to the spike protein, they're most likely correlated with neutralizing um, uh, antibodies and so protective immunity. So there was concern that we're seeing a decrease in antibodies to the spike protein. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we don't still have memory immunity to that, to those particular epitopes. Okay, if that question wasn't complicated enough, here's a really tough one. So look into your crystal ball for the future when we finally have a vaccine for COVID-19. Do you think that people who have had a positive antibody test should get the vaccine? Um, great question. One that seems to be coming up more and more uh, frequently. Um, so, you know, interestingly, it's not something that I've seen either the CDC or um, ACIP, which is the advisory committee on immunization practices. It's not something that they've commented on directly, although they've been working on putting together their proposed phased approaches for vaccine distribution for a while now. Um, generally speaking, I think it's fair to say that natural infection typically provides better immunity to um, pathogens as compared to vaccine-induced immunity. The problem here is that we don't technically know how long immunity from naturally infected individuals lasts for COVID-19. Uh, personally, I think it'll likely mirror that of what we see for the commonly circulating coronaviruses, where again, although we don't have sterilizing immunity, there's some level of protection for about a year or so, um, although that's obviously not yet proven for COVID. Um, so given that vaccine quantities will be fairly limited and in short supply initially, I think it would make sense that those individuals who previously have had mild or 
more severe disease or maybe not at the front of the line uh, to get the vaccine. Um, it's a little trickier though for previously antibody positive individuals because we have to consider how reliable that particular test result is. So if the test used is well vetted with superior specificity, or again, if an orthogonal testing algorithm was used, I'd be more comfortable saying, let's wait maybe on vaccinating you until a later phase versus someone that's antibody positive by a less accurate lateral flow assay, for example. Um, ultimately though, I think we're all going to follow the ACIP recommendations, which at least for now do not take into account prior antibody status for a go no-go uh, decision on vaccination. Um, instead, like many of you are uh, maybe familiar, their phased approach is really based on risk of infection and risk of severe disease. So the phase one vaccine recipients right now are going to include healthcare workers that are you know, essential for sustaining the ongoing response. Um, it'll also include those that are at highest risk for severe disease and, and death, and then personnel that are most essential for um, maintaining our societal functions, again, independent of prior antibody status. Thank you, Ellie. Melissa, I want to turn to you for a few minutes. There has been a tremendous amount going on in molecular testing for COVID-19, and we're going to try to just hit the high points. Let's start with the New York Times article that got a tremendous amount of, ten of attention over the summer. The title of the article was, quote, your coronavirus test is positive. Maybe it shouldn't be, end quote. And this was published on August 19th. We'll put a link to it in the notes. What do you think about this? Do you think PCR is too sensitive for COVID-19? Are there disadvantages to such very sensitive tests? Well, it was definitely a provocative article because it suggests that samples that are PCR positive greater than 30 cycles should be called negative and that these people should not have their contacts traced. And I haven't talked to a single clinical microbiologist. I haven't talked to all of them, but um, that would really consider doing this based upon what we know today. And in some data sets, according to the paper, this would be between 40 and 90% of the positive samples. I don't think our number is quite that high. It might be on that lower end. About 40% of ours would be over cycle 30. And of course, the actual cycle number depends on the platform that you're using. So to say an absolute number of 30 is not going to even be the same among all the platforms that we have in our lab. We've had many symptomatic and very sick hospitalized patients that had an initial NP positive that was greater than 30 cycles. And this article seems to blur the use of PCR for diagnosis with the use of um, a test to predict whether someone is infectious. And now we see this confusion even coming from the president's physician. I think it's safe to assume that higher viral titer in a person's airways um, means they're more likely to transmit the virus. There's just more virus available for potential transmission in, in closed spaces. What we don't know is exactly where that threshold is. So when we test a person, whether they're symptomatic or asymptomatic, we're assessing the viral load at that point in time. And we're assuming we're getting a well-collected specimen each time. And we know that's not always the case, although many of us have spent a lot of time trying to ensure that this is the case. So at that point in time, we have no idea if the viral load is heading up as if the patient was recently infected or if it's heading down, they were more distantly infected or whether they are a person that's maintained a low viral load the entire time. And, and not knowing this, we have no way of knowing what's actionable and what's not. It's really only this last scenario, someone who may have a low viral titer the entire time they're infected that maybe wouldn't need their contacts traced and tested. But having one point in time also doesn't help you think about quarantining because you may be low today, but you may be high tomorrow or in a couple um, of days from now. And as we've Again, seen playing out in the news these past few days, you can't really predict a person's behavior when they're found to be positive. So I think to assess a non-actionable result to any positive in a highly sensitive test is pretty um, irresponsible. It's it, We know it's difficult to culture the virus over cycle 33 or so, but what we don't know if this equates to transmissibility. Um, whether you're testing symptomatic persons or asymptomatic persons, if you get a positive result by a PCR test, even if it's cycle 35, it should be considered a positive result that's actionable. 
Of course, the issue with these highly sensitive tests such as PCR is the availability of them, the scalability of them, the turnaround time, all of these things have been um, talked about quite a bit in recent months. And uh, there's no question we need more tests, wide availability of tests that don't rely on the supply chain. And this may argue for less sensitive tests like say antigen, because they're cheaper, whatnot. But it doesn't mean that we should take a highly sensitive test and kind of dumb it down to the performance of an antigen test. I think these are tests that have unique purposes. Thank you, Melissa. That was very clear and I agree with everything you said. Um, let me ask you a, a, a question off script and that is, um, what do you think about reporting CT values um, for uh, SARS-CoV-2 PCRs? I think this is challenging. Um, I think there may be some value in, in quantitative results, particularly for institutions that may be, be involved in clinical trials for therapeutics. Um, things like that. And we've done this in the past here at UNC with um, influenza therapeutic trials. And surprisingly, you really can monitor the CT values in an NP swab over time on therapy. At least we know this with flu. It appears to be true for SARS-CoV-2. So I think this can potentially be valuable. However, I worry we don't have enough information and certainly our clinicians don't have enough information on what they should do with a CT value. So the information is there, right? Our real-time PCR tests are inherently quantitative, and most of us know enough about the different tests that we're doing to know how the CT values relate to each other. You know, this one's about 10 cycles less than this one, for example. Um, so we can help our providers interpret these. We do not report them in the medical record, again, because we're, um, again, you know, like Ellie said, with the quantitative antibody tests, these are not EUA authorized for quantitative reporting. Um, so there is that caution, but we, we will on occasion, especially if infectious diseases is involved, look at the cycle number. It has been helpful in some cases in thinking about reinfection versus whether this is prolonged um, shedding of the viral RNA, because many patients may have several negatives in between a positive, and we've worked up a few cases of quote unquote reinfection that when we look at this ET values of the new positive, it's a pretty low positive. So I think there's value, but um, with caution. Thank you. Thank you. So the FDA recently released the SARS-CoV-2 reference panel comparative data on the uh, website. And this panel consisted of various concentrations of inactivated SARS-CoV-2 that were sent to laboratories uh, or companies that had emergency use authorization for a SARS-CoV-2 test. The labs tested serial dilutions of the material in several blinded samples containing various concentrations of inactivated virus to establish a limit of detection for their assay. Um, and they reported those results back to the FDA, which then put them on the website I mentioned a second ago. Why did labs need to do this? what important data or lessons came out of this program? So participating in this reference panel testing was really a condition of EUA. So we all knew, those of us who went through the EUA process, that as more material became available, FDA could ask us to test it. So like many other CLIA labs with EUAs for an LDT um, and other diagnostic companies, we also participated in this and this is ongoing. So there's still um, data being populated on the website. So when most of us, at least in the very early days, first validated our tests, there were very few clinical samples available. There was limited quantitative material. So we relied heavily on spiked or contrived samples as the FDA refers to it. And so I'll be the first to admit, this is not normally how I would do a test validation, but as you, you all remember, we were in crisis mode and trying to get testing up and going. Absolutely. Yeah, so and we're still kind of in crisis mode yeah. <laughs> six months later. Um, so all of us did limit of detection studies, and if you look even at the commercial tests, the the um, units that are used are different. Sometimes it's copies per ml, sometimes it's TCID 50. Labs use different materials, and so it makes it very hard to compare analytic sensitivity from test to test. And so this panel um, being of a single source, the FDA was looking to obtain 
data from multiple EUAs to see how these LODs compare to each other. So it's important to know that the, the units of this reference material that went out is there, it's called NAT detectable units per ml, NDUs per ml. And as far as I can tell, it, it means nothing in terms of it doesn't correspond. Well, I mean, it doesn't correspond to a copies per ml or an international units per ml. And it doesn't seem to have a clear correlation to any of those. And, and I'll explain what I mean in a second. So okay. the panel also assesses for cross-reactivity with MERS-CoV. It's kind of the second panel that they include. So um, this is a step forward, I think, in further validation of our EUAs, but there are some caveats to be considered. So the material, um, rightly so, was heat inactivated before it was sent out to all of our labs. So some targets may be damaged and may not be able to be amplified. And so this may um, show some differential amplification in different assays. There's also subgenomic messenger RNAs that may impact quantification and test sensitivity, and this is gonna depend on the test targets. Um, as I look at the, the results that are on the website, there it doesn't clearly reflect, in my opinion, fold changes in sensitivity. And so what I mean is in our hands, the Abbott M2000 test had an LOD of 100 copies per ml. The Cepheid expert test had a 200 copies per ml LOD. And our lab developed test has an LOD of about 800 copies per ml. But if you look at the FDA results for these three tests, both Abbott and Cepheid was 5,400 of these NDUs per ml, and ours was 6,000. So it's, it's not the same relative difference in LOD, at least it's what in what we saw with copies per ml. So to give you a perspective though, the molecular point of care test, the Abbott ID now has a 300,000 LOD with the FDA panel. And even what we know in terms of its clinical sensitivity in symptomatic patients and its LOD, that still doesn't respond, um, uh, correspond with the, the same a uh, fold increase in um, or decrease in sensitivity that we know for that assay. So I'm not sure how to reconcile these data, but I think at least having some normalized assessment is, is valuable, but I, I think it needs some fine tuning. Thank you. Uh, let's turn to sewage. Uh, sewage testing for SARS-CoV-2, that is. Uh, obviously, testing sewage for SARS-CoV-2 is not going to be useful for individual diagnosis, um, although I bet we have all had requests for testing <laughs> on stool. Um, but we're talking about sewage here, not uh, stool from an individual. So what is uh, testing of sewage going to be useful for and what has it been useful for? I'm always happy to talk about poop as long as it's not C. diff. <laughs> so um, we know that SARS-CoV-2, or at least its RNA, can be found in the stools of both um, symptomatic and asymptomatic people. And it seems that it's in the stool long before, or before and long after any respiratory symptoms of those who end up being symptomatic. So even if you know stool is not a preferred specimen for diagnostic purposes, it may be very useful in sentinel surveillance. And we have an example of this. So this has been used before with polio, for example. So you can think of sewage, or maybe we'll call it wastewater. That might be a more pleasant term in case some of you are eating while listening to this <laughs> podcast. Uh, but wastewater is really a pooled stool specimen. And by quantitatively and serially testing wastewater, we can get insights into the disease prevalence in a community or whatever setting the wastewater is coming from. It can indicate an increase in disease may be coming, and it doesn't rely on a particular community's either need for healthcare access or access to clinical testing. So um, wastewater testing should definitely be trended, as I mentioned, kind of serial testing and even quantitative testing and used in conjunction with other surveillance testing. So for example, UNC Charlotte is collecting wastewater from 17 dorms and three Greek houses several times a week. And just earlier this week, they reported detection of SARS-CoV-2 in one dorm. And so then they went to the students in that dorm and they're now all getting tested. 
Similarly, at the beginning of the semester, University of Arizona was using wastewater testing and they likely stopped an outbreak um, early when students came back to campus by doing wastewater testing. So exactly how this wastewater surveillance might be used in, in larger community settings remains to be seen, but I do think it's a very interesting approach to pooled testing, as we've um, talked about before, that may indicate um, kind of a sentinel flag of, of disease prevalence. Pool, pooled testing, indeed. It does seem like it could be useful in a college setting, in a setting of about that size, at least. Tougher right. to see it being used in a larger city or something like that, but right, uh, right. thank you. Yeah. Um, and lastly, Melissa, on August 24th, the CDC updated its recommendations for testing on its website to say that asymptomatic persons, even those with exposure to a COVID positive contact, did not necessarily need to be tested. They reversed this recommendation on the website on September 19th. What do you make of all this? Well, we, and by we, I mean the ASM, Clinical and Public Health Microbiology Committee, and specifically the Subcommittee on Laboratory Practices, just submitted an editorial to JCM on this very topic. It, it was accepted yeah. yesterday. Yes, I know. Well, I figured you were the editor in chief. You could say that. Maybe I shouldn't say that. <laughs> so, if it's not on the website already, it will be. It will be very soon, and we'll put a link to it in the notes. Yes, thank you. So we, um, as well as as many of us in the community, were very concerned with the initial change that seemed to downplay the testing of asymptomatic persons, even contacts of positives. But what was perhaps more concerning was that the change seemed to happen all of a sudden and without any announcement or accompanying rationale, and that the change is not supported by the literature. So we all look to the CDC for guidance, but particularly in the midst of a public health crisis. And this has been one of several missteps that are eroding our trust in the CDC. Presumably this is due to politics. Several news outlets reported that this change came from the White House Task Force. So after this change occurred, ASM, IDSA, many other societies and professionals protested this change with letters, tweets, you name it. Um, thankfully, as you mentioned, the guidance on the CDC website was reversed about a month later, but again, with no real explanation. The key takeaway is that the data support testing asymptomatic persons broadly as tests are available. And limited testing resources, we may need to think about prioritizing and testing of uh, contacts of COVID positive cases should be a priority. In our editorial, we urge CDC to engage its stakeholders, including clinical microbiologists, infectious disease physicians, epidemiologists, prior to making such impactful changes in testing guidance because conflicting guidance not based on scientific as an evidence really results in confusion just not just for labs and providers but our hospital administrators are also seeing this change and even the public um, gets really confused and when we don't have a consistent message coming from our um, really premier public health institute in the u.s thank you melissa we're going to try something new right now. We are going to flip the microphone, and <laughs> Melissa and Ellie are going to be the hosts, and they're going to talk with me about an editorial that Dr. Matt Pettengill and I have in press at JCM. And the title of that editorial is, Can We Test Our Way Out of the COVID-19 Pandemic? So take it away, guys. All right, well, I think I'm first. So um, Alex, this editorial was in response to a proposal to use testing as a key part of reducing transmission for COVID-19. So can you tell us about that particular proposal? So it's a proposal that has been um, around for several weeks, a few months even, um, and it's gone through various iterations. And uh, the current version, which I think is um, the you know mature version, at least for the moment, is nicely summarized in a New England Journal of Medicine article titled Rethinking COVID-19 Test Sensitivity, A Strategy for Containment. So if people are curious about more information that I'm gonna provide, that's a great place to take a look at. Um, the proposal basically is that people um, should be performing very frequent up to daily testing for COVID-19 in the community-based settings, such as at home. And that would be done on self-collected specimens. And the self-collected specimen that's most frequently mentioned is saliva. And it would have a very simple readout, something like a paper strip 
test um, for the readout. People would then self-quarantine if they had a positive test result. Um, critical for this, because since huge numbers of people would be testing themselves very frequently, um, critical to this is that the tests be inexpensive. Um, prices like a dollar per test have been mentioned, $5 per test more recently has been mentioned. And along with that, um, because of the kinds of tests that can be done at home and the kinds of tests that can be made inexpensively, um, the test would be insensitive. Antigen tests have been discussed in this context. Um, some nucleic acid amplification tests have been talked about as well. But I think that um, there's a consensus around this that it's okay to have an insensitive test. And this comes back to something that Melissa was talking about a few minutes ago. Um, and that is the idea that an insensitive test is still adequate if it detects people who are infectious. So that's my, my capsule summary of the, of the proposal. Um, it's gone through various iterations and people can easily find it on the web, but that's kind of the, the gist of it. So Alex, you and Matt Penningill in your editorial, what did you have to say about this proposal? What's, what's the answer? Can we test ourselves out of this? Well, we, are, we weren't really saying yes or no about whether we can test ourselves out of the pandemic. We were raising a series of questions about whether this can work in the real world. Um, as a uh, aspirational method for addressing the pandemic, it's extremely appealing. But in thinking about how this might actually work, we thought about a number of real problems. And the first of those is that there is no such test. Um, there is no test that people can perform on a self-collected specimen that is simple enough to be done at home and available in massive quantity um, at this kind of price point. Um, some of the tests that have been promoted for this purpose are nucleic acid amplification tests, PCRs, or loop-mediated isothermal amplification, or LAMP tests. Um, and those are really fairly complicated and I think maybe beyond what people can do at home. Um, but to be fair to the folks who are proposing this, um, they're saying that we need this test, that there should be a lot of emphasis on developing such a test and an FDA pathway for approval of such a test. So that was first concern. Second concern, which I really, um, this one to me is the most serious, is the risk of false positive results and the consequences of false positive results. We all know that even a very specific test, like a 98% uh, specificity for the test, when that test is used on very, very large numbers of people will result in large numbers of false positive tests. And we gave the example in the article of a, a test uh, with 98% specificity, which is very realistic for these tests. If you did that to everyone, gave that test to everyone in the United States, 325 million people, setting aside the fact that some people would be too young and so on. But if you did that test on 325 million people, you would get six and a half million false positive results. We have seen clusters of false positive results in antigen tests. There were 65 such results in a, um, a occurrence in Vermont, only four of which were confirmed by a nucleic acid amplification test. There were 24 at a camp in Maine, none of which were confirmed by nucleic acid amplification tests. So false positive results would occur um, just by the nature of statistics and how things work when you test a lot of people with a good test. We were also worried about the effect that those false positives might have on people's willingness to be tested. Politics has hijacked the debate around the use of masks. Would that happen with home-based testing? Um, if people knew that a lot of the positive results were false positive results, would they then push back against uh, this kind of testing strategy? Um, and here we calculated another statistic. That is that if you had a test that's 80% sensitive and 98% specific, and a prevalence of 5%, the positive predicted value is only 67.7%. So a little less than a third of test results would be false positives. And then the last concern we raised, which Melissa, you discussed very nicely uh, earlier on, is whether insensitive tests can detect infectious people. And just to fill this out a little bit, um, this has never been shown, and it is largely assumed to be true I think, as you pointed out, that it is likely that higher viral titers will correspond to higher transmissibility, but that does not mean that these specific tests will detect people who are infectious. And just to provide an interesting example here, we had a paper in JCM where they used an antigen test and compared it to a PCR test. 
Um, and you would expect that if this test is, if the antigen test is going to detect people who have a high level of virus reliably, it would detect people who have a low CT value in the PCR. But in fact, that paper showed that 20% of the antigen tests were negative uh, on, when done on samples with CT values less than 25. And those to me are relatively high titer samples. So those are the concerns that we raised. Um, we really just wanted to kind of get a discussion going around this um, because it seemed to be a fairly one-sided discussion until we weighed in. And I think that your point, the discussion is critical to this. And as you also suggested, there's a whole psychosocial part of at-home testing that I think largely hasn't been considered. And I'm certainly not the one to think about it or talk about it, but something I think that should also be part of the discussion. So perhaps the most difficult question is for last for you, Alex, we'll see. Um, we can't leave this discussion this week, given recent um, events and COVID diagnoses of the president and other attendees at the Supreme Court nomination event, which has now been labeled as a super spreader event. Do you think these recent positives among the White House, congressional members and staff tell us anything about daily less sensitive testing? Yeah, I think they absolutely do. I, I think they clearly indicate that frequent testing with an insensitive test um, is not enough on its own to prevent transmission of SARS-CoV-2. Um, and this is clearly the case. The, the, so just, I don't have any insider knowledge about this, of course, I'm going from reputable news sources, but my understanding is that the tests that were being used at the White House um, there are two of them, the Abbott ID Now and the Abbott Binax Now. The Abbott ID Now is pretty well known to be a less sensitive test. It has the advantage of being fast and highly specific, but the sensitivity of the test is probably around 75% in most studies. And then the Abbott Binax Now is, to my mind, really of unknown sensitivity. We have the package insert, which shows high sensitivity in people who have had onset of symptoms within seven days prior, but we don't yet have peer-reviewed papers about the sensitivity of this test. And we know from lots of previous antigen tests that they tend to be somewhat less sensitive than nucleic acid amplification tests. And I suspect that will prove to be the case with Binax now, although I do not know that. So we have two tests um, of likely modest sensitivity and um, performing those and then allowing people to interact with one another without practicing social distancing, without using masks, without of doing all of the common sense things that we know to do to avoid transmission of the virus um, is clearly risky. And uh, that uh, is now coming to fruition with what looks like about 19 positives so far to date um, associated with that, uh, that event around the Supreme Court uh, nomination. Great, thank you, Alex. Yeah, so I'm looking at the clock here and if we're quick, we have time for a fast game if you guys are willing, what do you think? Let's do it. Try All right. It. So you're gonna to work together. My kids have both gone back to school recently and there has been a lot of two truths and a lie um, <laughs> as a way for the kids to get to know each other. So I am gonna, I've got three examples here. I'm gonna tell you two truths and a lie. Your job working together is, figure out, is to figure out which of these is a lie. So here's our first one. Number one. The CDC has rated trick-or-treat activities based on risk of COVID-19 transmission, including higher risk trunk-or-treat, where candy is handed out from trunks of cars lined up in parking lots. Next choice, the FAA is considering a plan to have airline pilots control airlines remo airplanes remotely to reduce the risk of COVID-19 transmission to critical staff. And third, the governor of Florida, Ron DeSantis, recently proposed a bill of rights for college students college students that would ensure the right of the college students to party. Which of those do you think is a lie? I'm gonna go with B, Melissa. Oh good, number two. Yeah. You both, you, so you both think it's the FAA? Yep. That is so. correct, that is correct. <laughs> that is the lie. I hadn't heard anything about yeah. so. <laughs> I was. I was sure you'd heard about the CDC thing. I didn't know if you'd have heard about the governor of Florida. Well, um, I'm a Floridian, so, well, I don't know uh, if I should admit that or not right now, but um, my parents keep me in the loop of what's going on there. Good, so Ron DeSantis fighting for the right to party. All right. So <laughs> There's a got, song about that. <laughs> you've, got one, you've got one right. If you get two right out of the three, you'll be winners and you'll have um, awesome bragging rights. 
Awesome. All right, next uh, are all things about detecting infected people um, who have COVID-19, but without using a clinical laboratory. So the first is a shoe company in Kansas that has installed a device that emits noxious odors into the lobby of the building. People who don't react to the smell are tested for COVID-19, while others are permitted to enter the workplace. Second, dogs are being used to screen passengers for COVID-19 at an airport in Helsinki. Travelers wipe their neck with a cloth, and then they put it into a little container, and the dog sniffs at them to test who may have COVID-19. And then your third choice, a company called Rokid plans to offer eyeglasses that include a 12 megapixel camera and an infrared sensor to detect the temperatures of up to 200 people at a time. This would allow rapid scanning, scanning of crowds for fever as a way to screen for people who may have COVID-19. Which do you think is a lie? So I've heard about the dogs. Yeah. I thought I had heard something about the glasses. Of course, I could have mm. dreamed this because my dreams are really vivid right now. <laughs> but I've not dreamed about the noxious odor. I've heard about like the sniffing of the wine every night, you know, to make sure you don't have COVID. <laughs> I do that. Um, that would be pretty rude, I think. I don't know. What do you think, Ellie? One or three? I'm thinking if you think you've heard about three, I'm going to go with one, two. As kind of what I think. All right. That's our final answer. Choice one. Yes. The smelly lobby. That is correct. No such thing. But dogs are being used to screen passengers at, um, at the airport in Helsinki. And I did find a story about that camera. I don't know how much traction that one's going to get. <laughs> wow. But the dogs, are, that's, that's happening. Yeah. Um, so that's two out of three. You guys have already won, but you can go for 100%. Um, and this is these last ones are all efforts to reduce transmission in social settings, bars and restaurants. So first choice, a bar in Milwaukee is offering customers use of sumo wrestler costumes to encourage appropriate distancing while drinking. That Second choice, <laughs> a cafe in Germany is requiring diners to wear hats that have two pool noodles at right angles to ensure appropriate social distancing. And third, Fishtails Bar and Grill, a restaurant in Maryland, plans to require diners to use bumper tables to ensure social distancing. The tables are on wheels and they are surrounded by a large inner tube, which is the lie. <laughs> I don't have much of an idea. <laughs> they all sound plausible. <laughs> well, I've heard about the pool noodles. So I think what, that's what, what was the last, the third one was the bumper tables. Oh, yeah, first, bumper tables. First but tables on what? wheels with a big inner tube. And the first one was the sumo wrestler costumes. I don't I think that can be true, right? How much would you disinfect them? <laughs> I'm going to go with, I don't know. I want to go with three. All right, we'll do three. I am glad I stumped you at least once. Oh, Melissa, you were right. Bumper tables is a real thing, or at least yeah. the plan was a real thing. I made up the sumo, sumo wrestler costumes. I, I like the idea, though. I be able to disinfect them, but then if you're at a bar, they're not really worried about disinfecting. <laughs> so. no. I wouldn't put it past a bar in Milwaukee to do something <laughs> crazy like that, though. <laughs> All right. Well, two out of three. You you guys are champions. You have awesome bragging rights. Maybe someday I'll have T-shirts or buttons or something. For prizes <laughs> for this. But for now, that's that's what you get. Um, thank you both. This has really been a lot of fun. I think it's been interesting and very helpful. And I want to thank you both for joining us. Thank you, Sally. We'll put links to several of the articles and other material that we discussed on the web page for the podcast. You can find the Journal of Clinical Microbiology at jcm.asm.org.